Thank you, Vuk. When Vuk first invited me to come here, we met a, a few months ago when he came out to the United States along with some coworkers uh, to visit us and to, uh, to learn about how government communicators in the United States work. And we had a wonderful conversation and he said, I'm doing a conference in September and you should come. And I said, really? And then I learned that he was serious and so here I am. You're, you're a good spokesman and, and a very good uh, representative of Montenegro and so now I'm here and I'm honored to be here. Ex excellencies, Madam Ambassador, honored guests, fellow government communicators. I would like to start things off, if I may, with a little bit of an exercise. And normally I have people stand up for this, and I would like to do that if it won't interfere with the camera back there. But let's try to do this. If you don't mind, please just deal with me for a moment. Please stand up, and I need you to select a partner. <laughs> please select a partner. There we go. Okay, so pair off. Each of you are now partners, and you decide between you. One of you will be partner number one, and one of you will be partner number two, and you decide who that's going to be. Be diplomatic, however you want to do that. <laughs> and now, so, so have we decided now, is everyone a partner one or a partner two? Partner one, raise your hand. Okay, now, what I want you to do, partner number one, I want you to make a fist. And when I say go, partner number two, try to open partner number one's fist. Ready? Go. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Wait, wait. wait turn about. Turn about is fair pay, fair play. So partner number two, now you make a fist. And when I say go, partner number one, you try to open partner number two's fist. Ready? Go. Okay, okay. That's good, that's good. Okay, sit down. So... This was a little bit of silliness, but how many of you were successful at opening your partner's fist? You were. How did you do it? She opened it for you. Anybody else successful? Madam Ambassador, what was the secret to your success? So, deception. <laughs> the rest of you were not successful. Why not? I heard some knuckles cracking up here. I saw some people tickling each other. I tried to make a point here, and I said a word many, many times as I was setting this thing up, and I said the word partner. And as soon as I heard, said the word go, you turned partner into opponent, and you were trying to wrench each other's hands open. Did any of you think to say, would you please open your hand? There you <laughs> So the, the point I wanted to make here is that we are all partners, and we must consider ourselves to be partners. We are partners with our government leaders. They're our bosses. We need to be partners with them so we can help them communicate. We are partners with our constituents to ensure that we are serving our publics the way they expect to be served and the way they need to be served. We are partners with the media who help us to carry our messages to our publics. And we are partners with our agency's internal organization, with our internal workforce, ensuring that our own people know what's going on in their own workplace. They know about our own programs, our own policies. And finally, we have to be partners with each other, sharing information about the best practices, what works, what doesn't work, facing our challenges together, 
And that's what I think is so exciting about the formation of the SECOM. This forum, I believe, is an ideal approach to creating these partnerships. As Vuk mentioned, in the United States, we have the National Association of Government Communicators, where communicators of all types, spokespersons, writers, editors, speech writers, webmasters, photographers, videographers, anybody who has anything to do with communications is involved from the federal, state, and local level. They're all part of this organization and so that we can network together and learn from each other. Among other opportunities, the NAGC puts together an annual communication school. We bring together expert speakers from across our many disciplines, uh, members of the media and others to provide training and to continue our networking and grow our professional development opportunities. As I looked at the agenda that we have laid out for the CECOM uh, this weekend, we're looking at some of the most critical issues in government communications today. Now, Vuk asked me to come and speak to you about the role of the government communicator. And as I see it, our role is to be an advisor, an advisor to our leadership. More than anything else, we should be advisors, trusted partners with seats at the table when policies are being decided so that we can understand the underlying issues and we can provide counsel on how to communicate those issues to our various audiences. As government communicators, we need to have an understanding of our agency's audiences, who they are, and be able to anticipate how those people will react to various messages, changes in policy, whether or not they'll take the actions that we want them to take, or whether or not they're even willing to listen to what we have to say. All of our audiences, and we have many varied audiences, have their own motivations and their own reasons for doing or not doing certain things. Their own opinions about the government, their own opinions about government spokespersons. And I'll tell you, we are not necessarily their favorite people. We as government representatives may not necess necessarily be one of those trusted sources of information. There was a survey done a number of years ago by the Public Relations Society of America, and they ranked the top 45, uh, I'm sorry, 44 professions that people believed were the most credible. Government public affairs officers, government spokespersons were number 42 out of 44. Only Jerry Springer and Britney Spears were less credible than we were. <laughs> so there are several questions that we must ask ourselves when we are planning our communication strategies. And these are the same questions, believe it or not, that media will ask us. They want to know who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who, what, when, and where, that's basic information. It's the kind of information we provide every day. The how is information that we give to someone when they need them to take action. There's a, we do that too. And there's an old proverb, give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you'll feed him for a lifetime. I disagree with this. Because there's something missing. If you give a man a fish, you give him the information, what fish can be caught, when and where. You can teach a man to fish, show him how to catch fish, how to make use of that what, when, and where information. But that man still may not be motivated to go out there and fish unless he knows why he should. It's the why that addresses the motivation. If he's not hungry, he's not going to fish. This is the way all of our audiences think. This is the way we think. When your mother said, no, you can't go do this, or your father said, no, you can't do that, you say, why? Now, my parents did it the easy way. They said, because I'm the parent, that's why. But I never really wanted to, I wanted to know, really, really, why? Let me understand. Our bosses want to know why. Reporters want to know why. Our fellow employees want to know why. Lawmakers want to know why they should continue to fund our programs or our agencies. Our constituents want to know why they should do something or not. Knowing why provides that value judgment of what people will or will not do. And people are bombarded by messages every day from millions of sources and they selectively filter what is of interest to them 
A common expression for this we say is, what's in it for me? You're doing this right now. You're saying to yourself, what's in this for me? You're deciding whether this fat American guy has anything to say of any value for you right now. And you are listening or not listening based on that value judgment. So when we try to communicate, we need to be aware of what those filters are for our audiences. And a great part of that filter is the element of trust. People will not listen to or follow people that they do not trust. Our bosses, our organizational leaders will not bring us into the inner circle. They will not give us the inside information and will not take our counsel if they don't trust us. If you're not a trusted source of information, reporters will not give you the opportunity to tell your side of the story. They won't use the information that you give them and they'll completely disregard it. And trust goes both ways. We have to trust reporters that they will use the information that we give them properly. If we don't trust a reporter, we tend not to be so open and honest with them. I'll tell you how this has worked out for me. Over my 30-year career as a government spokesperson, and in fact, not just professionally, but in all aspects of my life, I've found that if I'm open and honest with people, they tend to be open and honest with me. There's always rare exceptions, but this is true for a great majority of time. In over 31 years, I've had only three reporters, three, intentionally misuse the information that I provided. That works out to one bad reporter every 10 years or so. Not a bad ratio. I deal with anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 reporters every year. So that's one distrustful jerk out of every 20 or 30,000 people. That's not bad. I'll also tell you that if I developed a relationship with a reporter, they weren't one of the ones that violated that trust. They have never violated my trust and I've never violated theirs once we've established a relationship. And that relationship was built on trust. Now sometimes there's things we can't tell them there's always potential issues of security. Most reporters understand this. Most are willing to honor certain restrictions. Sometimes we don't have all the information ourselves. And I'll tell you now, it's okay to say I don't know because saying I don't know is much better than lying because as soon as you make something up, you've ruined any chance of trust and credibility. So, Obviously, we must be careful to protect security. We need to take a good look at information that in the past we have traditionally considered to be a security risk. Was that information really a risk to security or was it just potentially embarrassing for the agency or for the government? It's one of the hardest things that we have to overcome as we move forward in trying to create an open government. There really is only four things we need to be concerned about. This is something that Vuk and I uh, had discussed. Security, number one, obviously primary concern. Some information, if shared, can open a vulnerability or endanger the safety, or li or, uh, the safety of people or infrastructure or lives. Um, number two is accuracy. We should only give out information that's correct. And if we have incorrect information, we should correct it as soon as possible. The third consideration is privacy. The public has entrusted the government with their private information. Corporate America uh, and corporations and businesses that we deal with from government all over the world have entrusted us with business sensitive information, proprietary information as they work on contracts for us. This is a trust that we cannot violate. We must keep their privacy and protect it. And the last one is propriety. And this is basic courtesy, common respect, common sense, and dignity. We can say the governor made a mistake. We can say the governor committed a crime if he committed a crime. But we should not say the, government is, the governor is a stupid idiot. That's propriety. That's a value judgment. It's a personal statement. It's not an official government position. So these four things, security, Accuracy, privacy, propriety, S-A-P-P, SAP, remember that? Uh, that should be our guide. When there's a crisis, we have a responsibility to be responsive and forthcoming. People want information and they need it quickly. Keep within the boundaries of SAP, 
we should be releasing information as quickly as possible. In the United States military, they have a policy, it's called maximum disclosure, minimum delay. And I think it's a great policy to follow. We cannot achieve open government if people don't believe that we're open. And we have a long way to go to convince people that government communications is very, very different and very separate from politics. It's an unfortunate, common perception that they're one and the same, but they're not. And it's probably one of the most difficult challenges that we will have to face as we move forward because of old traditions of exclusion and secrecy, because of possible mistakes in the past. We have a lot of work to do to establish that trust with our publics and our audiences to prove to them that we are truly being open. In the United States, we've also been working toward this goal of achieving open government. Government communicators at all levels, federal, state, and local, have learned a great deal and are willing to share their best practices with you. We too are building partnerships with our leaders, our stakeholders, the media, and with each other. We too are working to understand the motivations of our audiences and how to address that what's in it for me filter. We too are working to engender an atmosphere of trust. So I'm happy to announce today that the United States National Association of Government Communicators, which has been traditionally limited to people affiliated with government agencies in the United States, is opening its doors, its membership, and its arms of welcome to the members of the Southeastern European Communications Forum. We look forward to being your partners moving forward and helping to develop and refine good, open government communications practices and policies, not just locally, but on a global scale. Congratulations on this remarkable first step. Havalavam. <laughs>